Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Patrick Bedwell, head of the Mighty Product Marketing Team at Nozomi Networks. And with me is Chris Grove, our technology evangelist. Uh, before we get started on the actual uh, webinar itself, there's a couple of points of housekeeping I'd like to cover. First is, as we're talking, if you have any questions, if you could put them in the questions window down on the console, and we'll get to them at the end. And then secondly, we will send you out a link to the recording tomorrow. So by all means, uh, check your inbox. The conversation today is around uh, data centers and migrating to the cloud. And is your OT security infrastructure ready? Data center migration has been a, a topic or an issue for IT teams for several years. And now we're seeing it on the OT side of the house as well. Some of the causes of the migration uh, trend is overall digital transformation. Uh, in other words, a general uh, adoption of new technology to gain competitive advantage. Sometimes it's, uh, or oftentimes it's a lower cost uh, initiative as well, whether it is to converge uh, separated OT and IT teams, whether it's to eliminate or significantly reduce the expensive real estate that data centers can uh, take up. Uh, sometimes it's also consolidation of isolated applications. And then last but not least, of course, is the scalability and the elasticity of demand that clouds can accommodate much more easily than a typical on-premises environment. Okay, so with that, Chris, uh, let's say you are part of an OT team that has been uh, not, that it's not had to deal with uh, the migration challenge yet. Uh, Gardner calls it a cloud first strategy where an organization has decided to move some or all of their uh, data center into the cloud. And this IT team that you're part of, this, sorry, this OT security team that you're part of has just been told you got an initiative in 2021 to migrate. Um, what advice would you give them as to where to start? Uh, what should they consider about their overall security strategy? Uh, what should be going through their mind? Yeah, hi, Patrick. Uh, first, thanks for having me here today and i um, excited to talk about this topic. Um, cloud has been a game changer on the IT side it's also enabled IoT to grow at a very rapid rate, and it's only obviously a matter of time before OT is heavily impacted by cloud computing. Um, there's a lot of advantages, some of which you've highlighted there, and um, that's, I think, the first starting point for any OT team that is being tasked with considering a move to the cloud is understand what those advantages are of getting there, because those are gonna help prioritize and decide which systems and which functions of the business that we should be moving up to the cloud. So if one, if, if let's say for example, our uh, um, business runs a multitude of factories out there and we make widgets and um, we have a variety of different OT equipment from PLCs, HMIs, we have a manufacturing execution system and we have some infrastructure in place to help employees just do their day-to-day -day tasks. Some of that is gonna work well by moving to the cloud and some of it might not. So prioritizing and understanding what all of the different business functions are and the uh, typical things that you get out of your on-premise IT department um, and seeing which of those are gonna work better in the cloud versus on-premise and which cloud you're gonna use and what type of cloud computing. Um, so that's generally, got, I think, going to be the first step is understanding your target, where you're going to, and why the business is moving there, because that'll help clarify a lot of questions later. Things like, how would we handle this? Why would we do it that way? What about this risk? Why are we doing it um, in a particular uh, platform, for example, or why are we choosing that? If you really understand the target, where you're going, a lot of times those questions can be answered first. So I think that's a very important first step. Yeah, that's a good point. If you don't understand where you wanna go, it's hard to know how to get there, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for the attendees on the webinar, what we've got is a poll question we'd like to ask you now to get a sense of your migration to the cloud, your strategy, and we'll give you a minute to answer. The, the question is, what's the status of you or your customer's security migration to the cloud? So if you are, for example, a reseller, 
a service provider, if you could put on your, your thinking cap and come up with what you think overall represents most, the majority of your customers in terms of where they are. So you've got a choice of, of five in terms of you're there, uh, you started, you're still planning, you have no plans, or you don't know. And don't know is just a perfectly fine answer sometimes too. So Chris, in terms of, of uh, the priorities you spoke of a moment ago in, and the, the different uh, elements that make up a typical OT security environment, is there one that you think is a, should be prioritized more than others or the highest, or is it really something that's unique for everyone? So I, I do think um, based on what I've seen out there from uh, other environments that have migrated to the cloud, it does help to think about infrastructure first rather than the applications. Um, there are two different approaches to it. There are the application, there's the application developer approach where, um, so are we gonna, do you wanna stop and talk about the uh, poll for a minute? Yeah. Okay, because I thought that was pretty interesting that most people are still planning their migration. So I feel that this webinar is right um, in line with our audience. Uh, most OT, most OT environments are it somewhere in the journey, and as you can see, very few of them are boom, we're there. I thought that's um, pretty much what we expected. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually a little surprised that there's there's not uh, more along the migration path already. Um, just because, as I said, it has been a, a, a thing on the OT, I'm sorry, the IT side of the house for, for several years. And given the overall consolidation of OT and IT that we've seen, uh, I would expect that some OT shops would have been sort of dragged along already, but it's interesting. Yep. Okay. All right, so back to what you were saying, you were talking about infrastructure being a priority or being the, the highest yeah. priority. Yes, um, so there's a couple different approaches. One is from like an application developer approach where you're gonna write your code and then the cloud is just there to provide the infrastructure around it and it doesn't really matter. And then there's the other way um, where you are responsible for running IT infrastructure and you're gonna use the cloud to um, run that infrastructure now. So I do think if we're talking about OT environments, Thinking about the infrastructure first might be helpful, things like authentication, because you'll need that later, especially if your application team decides to move applications up there, they're gonna need some of this infrastructure in place anyway. So if you have an Active Directory, you might consider moving some of that to the cloud. Maybe even the, in the beginning, considering the cloud as your disaster recovery site or a third tertiary DR site and start to see how that works for you. and um, it might help to determine which cloud platform is the uh, fir best first step. And then from there, start to think about easily commoditized services like DNS. That's um, pretty easy to um, run anywhere. Um, most of the time, that's not very site specific, except for the data that was, is within there. So most cloud providers can do a great job of running a DNS server for you. Websites, web servers, obviously public facing stuff is gonna do really well there, but we don't come across a lot of that in the plants. So, and in factories and in OT environments. So um, getting a connection to the cloud from the plant level IT data center can help to open up the door for new things like offsite storage. Now we can do backups to the cloud if we have an open tunnel to the cloud and start moving some data out of there and freeing up some resources inside the data center. And then once we have that, we're comfortable with that data living in the cloud for a while and we've figured out how to control access to it and we are securing it properly, then we can start using it for production. Maybe pull our, and maybe we can include that in our annual report. Um, prior to the cloud, maybe our uh, manufacturing execution system made reports, but we can only run reports on up to a month of data because it was such a large data set on the historian. Now with the cloud, we can do real time or we can do annual reports, for example. So start to expand your business operations to include what you've um, already moved to the cloud. And then over time, you can start to migrate more and more of that data up to the cloud. So that's, I think, one approach. And another one is, um, like I mentioned first, and that is the application developer approach. And that is to say, well, 
let's forget the concept of Windows, Linux, the historian, the software, everything. I just need to store information. And then with the cloud now, you have a destination point and all that's been obscured and you no longer really talk about the platforms and how it's being stored. It's just magically being done for you. So I think that both of those approaches are a valid way to decide what to move to the cloud. Um, but I think we're a pretty far way away from real time, real time cloud controlling industrial computers that are like building vehicles and doing cars and things. I know there's some things out there where people are experimenting with it, but full blown cloud automated factory operations are um, still a little bit far away from most companies. And um, eventually we will be there though. Um, I do think OT will take the same route as IT in the future and realize the advantages, the higher level of security, the availability that you get out of it, and the quick um, deployment of new features and applications and, and new ways of using it are readily available for internal teams to focus on using information rather than trying to manage information. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent point. Because that's one of the, certainly one of the things that a lot of teams spend a great deal of time on is managing that information rather than using it. Right. Okay. So let's now change the topic or go on to topic number two, which is some of the common mistakes. So now, Chris, that same team you're part of, the hypothetical team that you were told you got to migrate to 2021, uh, and now you've got this plan, you went through the prioritization process. What are some of the, the common mistakes around migrating that some, uh, that migrating some or all the security stack, uh, what are some of the common mistakes that, that teams make during the migration process? So I would think one is um, using the mindset that it's just a virtual environment and that you can just take a server or a VM, you can do this and, and um, just forklifting it into the cloud and putting it there and now you are cloud computing. I think that's the wrong mindset because it you need to rethink your stuff and it needs to be reborn in the cloud in order to take full advantage of what the cloud has to offer from instantiating systems in multiple regions and high availability and all the protections and all the stuff is going to require cloud native um, features and things within the functions that you put up there so thinking that you can just copy the windows vm and and put it there and that's done is is not really the right approach it's thinking about the functions that you're getting out of that vm like what is it doing for me it's providing this piece of information okay how do we do that in the cloud now is the actual question not how do i move it from here to there so when you get in the mindset of just copying everything from the data center to the cloud you end up having to troubleshoot a lot of things and fix a lot of things and it becomes very quirky and overly complex one of the beauties of the cloud is its simplicity and the ability to have a large amount of things done very simply and if you add complexities to it because of the way that you migrated it's going to like cause a lot of problems down the road now with security uh, when we're using the cloud as i mentioned earlier focusing on the data and not managing data is a true advantage to a security practitioner because we don't really want to spend all day turning screws and racks, running cables and data centers. We'd rather look at traffic and analyze attacks. And if we could leverage the cloud to get us straight to where we provide the most value and all of our tools provide the most value, then it really helps cybersecurity and it makes it more efficient and um, we can focus on what we do rather than the managing of the infrastructure. Got it. So in uh, terms of migrating, let's say, workloads to the cloud, and as you said, it's not just a simple, uh, I have a VM on-prem, I can upload it to AWS or Azure and it'll, it'll be just fine. Uh, one thing that I know cloud migration or, or workload migration, because of the consumption-based cost model, there's an unknown in terms of how much it's going to cost. And there's oftentimes uh, underestimating just how expensive sometimes workloads can be 
to run in the cloud or that people are thinking that there's no cost. It's just they have these instances, they can throw their data up there and and uh, until they see the bill from, from their service provider after one month or something. What are some other um, places where people make incorrect assumptions, do you think? Uh, well, that's a really good point first about um, not quite understanding um, the cost of the cloud. Um, in fact, just to provide some context around how quick your bill can get ramped up, um, I think it was five or six years ago, there was a developer that was writing some code for AWS and accidentally uploaded his AWS private key to GitHub, realized what he did um, when he got woken up in uh, the middle of the night, AWS calling saying, hey, your bill is like going super high. You might want to check your uh, your account. They actually let him know. And he'd gone in. I think he had some $50,000 in expenses on an account that usually was a few hundred dollars. It only took these guys uh, a very short period of time, bad attackers, to grab that key and use it to start mining Bitcoins on his account. And they probably could have done a lot more. They probably assumed that uh, he wouldn't notice $50,000, but um, it's, it's that quick that you can ramp up an AWS account. It could just be a script error. You might, instead of um, running one to one machine, you might run one to 100 machines by accident. Maybe you accidentally hit a couple zeros. So now you have a hundred servers out there billing at 100 times the cost that you thought you were gonna actually be doing. Then there's the um, developers that like to test code or experiment or have a development environment um, or a QA environment and spin up a whole army of machines that sit there and get forgotten and lost in the asset inventory and just the account grows over time because of um, not really knowing exactly who's doing what. So there's a lot of ways that your AWS account can get expensive. And that's besides just the regular usage of it. Uh, I worked with one global uh, entertainment company to launch a console and they weren't exactly sure uh, the load that they were expecting they knew that people were lined up around the block at best buys all over the world and um, as the regions came online there was millions of people flooding the systems and they weren't sure what games were going to be played if they were going to go home and play right away they were going to play a single player first or they were going to jump online there's a huge unknown and they had to accommodate this unknown load, so they ramped up the cloud, did a great job with it, but then they got that bill and they reversed their trend and went to a hybrid model where they run some infrastructure in their data center and some in the cloud. And that was their learning lesson was, um, if it was a learning lesson, it could have just been that it was good decision to be prepared for anything at all costs and be able to handle it and then learn from that and later on, make adjustments to your footprint in the cloud and make sure that things are done right. But they had a very, um, a lot of publicity around that simply because of the security. They had been hacked um, uh, recently before that and there was a lot of uh, Fox, CNN, all the major media carried stories about this company's hack. So there was a lot of pressure to get it right and they chose the cloud to do it right. And there's a reason why and it's because you can get much more, uh, security in the cloud than you can in traditional systems and if you approach it that way that security is what i'm trying to do rather than cutting costs then you're going to get it if you build from the ground up with your goals in mind you can accomplish those goals much quicker and much cheaper and much easier in a cloud than you can in a traditional data center and um so i think not always it's it's not always about making a mistake it's about knowing that it's a journey and you're gonna learn along the way and that you might initially choose to go to Amazon and deploy some stuff and then figure out that you might also need Azure to do some stuff or vice versa. It might be that you initiated your journey thinking that you were gonna only have one cloud partner and now you have different cloud partners or you have some stuff that are, is now a, a SaaS um, product rather than you running your own um, servers for it. You know, some companies may decide to ditch their lead generation or their customer contact management servers altogether and then go to something like Salesforce, as an example. Yeah. So let's uh, let's pull on that thread a little bit more. The, the third area I want to look at was um, 
the issue of well, which platform? We talk about the cloud, and there's public cloud, private cloud, you know, hybrid clouds, which are a combination of public and private clouds. There's also SaaS. If you're this, if you're the the IT or the OT team that I talked about in the previous two questions, how do you make the decision so you know what your you know what your objective is? Uh, you you've now got the idea of what mistakes to avoid. How do you how do you then decide where should the data reside or what what's the uh, the technology you're going to use? Well, um, I think first it's not a decision that you should make on your own. Um, understand that moving to the cloud doesn't mean that we are um, getting rid of our IT management teams. It just simply means that now we're going to be working with people that know cloud computing rather than just data center computing. So the question still remains is what is the environment comfortable with? What do you have expertise in? So I wouldn't pick Azure if I have 150 certified AWS engineers sitting right next to me. Um, you want to make sure that you, you can choose something that the organization can swallow and live with. You don't want to have to um, have all the complexities of cloud computing in addition to the complexities of trying to convince your organization to take that route. You should all be working together on it. It's going to encompass a lot of different teams. Um, for example, moving just a web application to the cloud might require working with a team that manages the, D the DMZ, the, act the uh, Active Directory for authentication, development teams. I mean, there's a variety of teams that you will need to work together to get something to operate there. So you want to make sure everyone's capable of speaking that language. And if you've already chosen as an organization a cloud platform, I would recommend starting with that one rather than trying to make your own decision because um, they have a lot of similar offerings. And going from a traditional data center to any of the top five cloud platforms is probably going to be a step up. Yeah. And do you have an idea or do you have a, a timeline in your mind when we talk about cloud migration and how long is it something that a team can do in you know one quarter, six months, one year, 18 months? So if we had this webinar in January, I would have had one answer. But now <laughs> after COVID, my answer now is I'm simply amazed at what these cyber security teams have been able to accomplish given the conditions. Some of these went from like 9% to 50% remote access in a matter of days. So um, I think if we were facing some major problem and it was all hands on deck, I think they could move swiftly. If we just move at our own leisure, um, I think it's, it is a journey rather than an event. So it's hard to measure exactly how long that's gonna take, but I do think it's inevitable. So putting, um, it not really moving in that direction or thinking that we're not going to go there, I don't think is very realistic. Um, eventually, we would end up with machines. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of advantages to being there. And um, eventually, it's going to be there. So it's better to start baking it in from the beginning and getting the expertise on the teams and start to take advantage of it rather than fight it. OK. So let's have a, our second poll question. It's going to be around the migration of the cloud in terms of if you were migrating to the cloud, what your preferences are, whether it's private cloud, public cloud, hybrid, SaaS, or don't know. And as I said before, if you are a, a reseller or a service provider, if you could um, come up with what you think the average answer is, a typical customer of yours would say. Um, so. Uh, we're we're coming to the end of the the our our piece, and we want you to ask questions. So after you've done you're done answering the poll, if you could take a moment and have any put any questions you have in the questions uh, part of the console. Something else that we are interested in knowing is uh, we've been doing these webinars for several months now, and probably about six months. And we, we want to know if there are topics you'd like to have us cover in the future. So even if you don't have a question, for example, if you've got an, an idea on, on a topic you'd like covered, 
you can put that in the question box as well. And we will see the results momentarily. Um, hmm. Wow. That's interesting. I'm surprised at the the uh, private cloud, frankly. That's a higher number than I thought there would be. Yeah, and it also makes a lot of sense because, you, you know, um, just in an OT environment, you like having as much of that as close to the devices as you can to eliminate certain problems, um, delay, et cetera. So I can, um, yeah, I think that's um, interesting. And I'm also, uh, I also find interesting no SaaS. So it almost seems like there's a market there for SaaS products for OT. No, nobody's really biting right now. <laughs> there's, I guess, not enough interesting stuff. Yeah, well, there certainly is a, on the IT side, SaaS is wow. gaining popularity. And so I would expect that OT would come along as well yep. eventually. I think, and there's also probably a lot more cloud computing happening in the OT environment than um, folks actually understand. For example, there are a lot of products out there, including cybersecurity products that pull things like threat intelligence or vulnerability information in from the cloud. And then there's also products that run in the cloud and monitor their um, devices inside. There are firewalls and border perimeter stuff that work with um, uh, endpoints through the cloud. There is a lot of different things happening on the back end of various products in the infrastructure where cloud is being leveraged, but you just don't necessarily see it on the front end. So it's there probably, it's just prob it, it's just not in control or in the hands of the um, OT engineers. It's on the back end of the products that they're using. Yeah, I agree. Okay, Sandy, what do we got in terms of questions? Let us know. Sandy, Sandy Keen, by the way, is our producer. And so she is running the polls and uh, providing us information on any questions that are coming in. So if you haven't asked your question yet, by all means, please do. And so far we have no questions, so yep. we'll give it another 30 seconds and then we will end the webinar. So uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Oh, looks like we got one. Uh, I'll read that one. Um, what do you feel is the greatest risk brought to OT from cloud computing. Okay, so um, I'll take that one if you want, Patrick. Sure. So um, the greatest risk to an OT environment coming from the cloud is probably um, users maybe, or hackers or attackers coming in via the cloud to an environment. And I think the way to mitigate that is the same as you would mitigate something like VPN connections or other networks, et cetera, that would be doing the same type of thing. So if you are thinking about securing your facility, your PLCs and your plant line and stuff, and you have your layers one and two, have your connections out, I would consider the cloud as simply another one of those connections. So you're still gonna wanna sit there and monitor all the equipment and you might um, also add in some object to define what the cloud is. And that way, if you see the cloud reprogramming a PLC and you know that you haven't really done that with your team yet, that you guys haven't really adopted the cloud to that extent, then you can kind of instantly know that, hey, this zone should not be talking to that zone in this manner, or these protocols should not be traversing these networks. And being able to monitor the cloud, just like you would monitor a VPN connection or uh, a wireless network in your environment is key to being able to reduce the risks from connecting any clouds to your data, to your OT data centers. I agree. In a, my former life at a company uh, that had cloud-based technology, the lack of um, equivalent layers of protection when companies were, when organizations were migrating to the cloud, what 
we found was that the, the biggest mistake they were making, besides some basic hygiene things you talked about, was that they weren't, they didn't have, they hadn't replicated the defense in depth, so to speak, that they had for the on-premises network. Uh, they had they had fewer layers of protection. They had maybe a firewall, but they didn't have IDS, for example, or they didn't have network uh, detection and response um, in terms of visibility into the lateral movement. And so they had, for whatever reason, thought that one layer of protection was sufficient. So mm -hmm. anyway. Right, that air gap that, um, first uh, the air gap sort of faded away and now cloud is upon the data center. So I uh, sort of, um, yeah, I, I feel the pain that the OT engineers are going through uh, watching their perimeter sort of dissipate away and now there's clouds. <laughs> Okay. The another question is, what criteria do you suggest to select a good cloud service? Do you want me to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so I would start with probably Gardner and um, look at their analysis and help to, to help them. Sorry, help use them to help yourself understand what each cloud provider has in its offering. Um, they do offer different things. If um, if I was a pure uh, if I was a shop that had pure one platform, I might choose one provider. If I was a different platform, another one might be better. I'm not going to mention their names or their platforms, um, just because I don't want to put them in a box. But you might find that one is more comfortable to use than the other one if you're the one making the decision and you don't have anybody else that has any say in it then um, I would start with the top two, which would be uh, Amazon AWS and Azure. If if you don't have any requirements that are really putting you in a certain box, most likely all your needs will be met by those two. Then there are other options as well. There's the CenturyLinks and there's a whole bunch of other companies that offer things. Uh, even in China, there's Aliyun with AliCloud and there are um, a whole bunch of other comp yeah, providers out there to choose from, dozens of them that are all really good and serve different purposes, different markets and have different um, pricing and advantages. So a lot of research would be required to pick um, a proper cloud provider if you have very specific requirements. If you don't have very specific requirements, it's probably gonna be those two I mentioned. Okay. And just to follow up on something you said, you mentioned Gartner. I found that, uh, so if you're thinking to yourself that you're not a Gartner customer or Gartner client, uh, don't worry, Gartner has published a lot of research, a lot of uh, mm -hmm. content for free that's accessible by anybody around cloud migration strategy. It's something that they've been following for several years. And so there's several good documents that help, can help organizations uh, start down the planning process and selection criteria for the different technologies. Yep. Okay, it looks like we've got another question here. Um, it says, Chris mentioned many security feeds are cloud-based. My experience is customers do not connect to cloud for real-time feeds, but rather import those feeds via a trusted offline mechanism on a periodic basis rather than be connected to the cloud. Does that correlate with your experience today? Um, great question, whoever that was. Um, I would say yes, it does, especially in certain environments where they're still trying to practice having an air gap or they've did, they've gotten rid of the air gap, but they're only connecting to corporate, for example, or they they um, do have internet access, but they don't want to do any real-time updates. There's no question there, there's a valid use case for that still today. Um, there's even other uh, customers customers or sorry not customers because it's not specific to our technology but users of cloud computing that also need to check to make sure updates are um, valid for their environment so they do want to take the manual method and download and then manually uh, push the updates on their own so even though cloud computing can offer um, an automated update it doesn't necessarily mean that it is automated because when the user downloads it to do the manual update, they're probably still downloading it from the cloud. So even in that case, the cloud is still being used for the delivery of that file, but the last step is being manual. So I hope that answers that question. Yep. All right. Like, 
Okay, we're going to wrap up. And on screen right now is a list of additional resources. If you're not aware, we have content, we have product, we have Guardian Appliances as well as our central management console on the Azure Marketplace. We also have it available in AWS. Uh, there's some other listings of, of content that uh, was there that you may find useful. We will be sending this information to you tomorrow along with the recording the webinar and a podcast format so you can listen to it rather than watching it. Thank you again for attending everyone. Thank you, Chris, for uh, presenting with me. And thank, thank you, you, Sandy Keen, for an amazing job running the, the behind the scenes. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Take care.